launch of Constitution Week lesson plans for high school teachers. Model Constitution Week lesson plans, I should say, are crafted by the Civics Alliance and Freedom in Education. And I am delighted to have as our participants, well, yours truly as moderator, uh, David Randall, um, executive director of the Civics Alliance, and also has a hat as director of research for the National Association of Scholars. Um, our first speaker is Jonathan Burak, who has produced a wide variety of history curriculum materials for middle and high school students for decades, including a, an extensive line called Mind Sparks. Uh, we also have Alex Nestor, who is an investigative fellow at Parents Defending Education and the political director of PDE Action, and Steve McGuire, the Paul and Karen Levy Fellow in Campus Freedom at the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, otherwise known as ACTA. We should have had, but uh, unfortunately cannot have due to a last minute emergency, uh, Rich L. Sorelli, um, who, a veteran of the U.S. Army in advanced placement U.S. history, ESL U.S. history, and unlevel U.S. history teacher, which is to say um, we were going to be getting the direct K-12 teacher's perspective. We will attempt to cover as best we can, and you know, terribly sorry that Rich couldn't make it. Now, just a little bit about the format. Uh, it's going to be... Um, First, uh, John will speak, then Alex, then Steve, each of them you know, for perhaps 12 to 14 minutes, but we're, we can go a little long. There's then going to be digital Q&A uh, and moderated discussion. That means you should put in your questions and comments um, into, ch well, either the chat button or the Q&A button uh, at the bottom. I, I would say stick to chat just if we're going to choose one, but I will look at both. I will pass them on, but of course the speakers can also look themselves to answer. Um, when I select questions, I just do them to do the conversation nicely. I might come up with a few of my own. There's a very important point. If your questions don't get answered by the end of the meeting, I will be delighted to forward them to the speakers so they can have the option to answer you. And also, if you have to get off partway through, this is recorded. It's going to be on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel in perpetuity starting, well, I say within 24 hours, but frankly, it sometimes feels like it's more like within 24 minutes because chance is pretty fast with this. Um, so you'll get a chance to look at this if you go away, um, you know, come back to it whenever. I'll just mention that Chance has also put into the webinar chat a link to the actual Constitution Week lesson plans. I encourage you to click on the link and you know that'll enable you to see them. They are, by the way, quite snazzily and beautifully done by Chance, Kaylee, Gerard, my other colleague, and Beckenstone Design. Wonderful stuff they've done. Having said all that, John, would you be so kind as to tell us about the Model Constitution Week lesson plans? Okay. Um... Well, these five, there are five uh, Constitution Week lesson plans that uh, were uh, lessons that were completed. Um, yeah, we've got the table of contents up there. I'll I'll get to that in a minute, but um, uh, these were done ultim uh, ultimately to be part of a an entire twelfth grade civics course, and that course and each lesson in it is to be based on the American birthright standards. Uh, the course will focus on the core concept central to the American Republic and to Ameri the American birthrights mission. And those are to teach students to understand and fully appreciate the, the liberty of the individual, the rule of law, the Bill of Rights, elections, checks and balances, federalism, equality under the law, the importance of military service, civil rights, trial by jury and other due process rights. Uh, and religious freedom and the place of faith in the nation's civic culture. Uh, these are all central to an understanding of the founding principles of the United States and the functioning of its Republican government. Uh, the course will also encourage students to deeply revere the civic order they've inherited, uh, to appreciate how it facilitates all efforts to right wrongs and um, enhance liberty. Unfortunately, too many educators now promote a sweeping disdain for the nation and its past. They seem to think this will produce more critical and hence more engaged citizens. But uh, in my view, critical is not the right word. Cynical is more apt. 
And as for engaged, this denigration of America's past is more likely to foster a sullen, passive, and disengaged uh, citizenry. Uh, to be truly engaged and active in any positive uh, effort, uh, citizens must love and revere and honor the nation's principles and its past struggles. Well, in any case, that's the spirit uh, I've tried to encourage in the lessons we've designed. So uh, the five Constitution Week lessons uh, were created with the assumption they'd be preceded by several lessons that will first introduce basic concepts and uh, these 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 are just in the beginning stages of being planned out, but uh, the they they will explore the the central ideas and institutions that help shape the Constitution, such as uh, the central place of religion in early American life, the colonial experience and the British political heritage, the Enlightenment, the Declaration, the Revolutionary Era, the Articles of Confederation, and the key founders and their gathering in Philadelphia to write the Constitution. So just keep that in mind. That's that that the, these five lessons are set in a context. They're meant to be a, a, a an early overview of um, constitutional issues that the whole course will explore in greater depth. So uh, we can talk a little bit more about uh, the rest of that plans for that course, but uh, I'd like to now I'd like to take a look at the five lessons and give you an idea of what of what's in each one so yeah this is the this is the list of them um that first one uh is uh, uh it starts with a background essay uh that sets the constitution and its historical um yeah you don't have to go through all of this here chad just keep the keep that page up uh, i'll tell you when when i what i want to do is look closely at lesson two, but I want to just dis briefly describe these five first. Um, so, so the first one uh, uh, focuses on the uh, central features of the Constitution, and in, in particular, the separation of powers among the three branches of the federal government. Uh, and, it, uh, and then three groups of students will be set up to review Articles 1 or Article 2 or Article 3, and uh, they get several questions that ask them to summarize the uh, for uh, for the class the the key powers of their assigned branch. Uh, day two, which we'll look at in a lot more depth in a minute, but uh, day two is about the checks and balances in the Constitution, uh, emphasizing that while they're separate, the branches share powers with each other, and it's this that enables them to check one another. Uh, students will read a brief essay on this, and um, then in, uh, they get a short summary of a Supreme Court case with the congressional that was uh, uh, involved the congressional versus executive power, and the case uh, calls attention also to the Supreme Court's uh, power of judicial review, and the activity asks them to consider the court's decision and a dissent to that decision. And in a minute, we'll go through that, and I'll show you how the whole lesson is structured. Uh, the third uh, one, a federal constitution, is about the uh, relationship between the state governments and the national government. Uh, the stresses on how uh, central the states are to the way the national government works, and including um, the part they play in its checks and balances. And then student groups debate conflicting sources from James Madison and Brutus, who was uh, an anti-federalist, possibly Robert Yates of New York, I don't think anyone knows for sure, uh, on whether the Constitution would completely undermine state authority and on whether a t uh, territory lar uh, territorially large federal republic would endanger or enhance liberty. So that's what they deal with in that one. Then uh, the fourth lesson, the great compromises, why they were ne necessary, uh, uh, the uh, lesson has a special focus on the on the slavery issues role in these compromises. So students get to stu study uh, and discuss primary source passages by Madison, Jefferson, uh, Governor Morris, Oliver Ellsworth, Charles Pinckney, and some others. And then they debate two uh, fairly detailed paragraphs that express 
two opposing views as to whether the compromises over slavery were reasonable. And then finally, uh, the ratification debates and the Bill of Rights. Uh, the essay here that they students read is uh, on uh, the central place of the Bill of Rights in the arguments that went on between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Um, expressing different opinions about whether the uh, whether there was a need for a Bill of Rights. And uh, then they're given instructions uh, for writing a, DB, a DBQ essay, a document-based question essay, uh, asking a central question about these sources. So that's, in a real quick nutshell, that's what the five lessons um, cover. So if we could go and look now at lesson two, uh, starting on page 32, I think that's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly go through how the, how the lessons are structured. Uh, the first page is just a, a general overview of what the objectives are for, for students. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going, actually, nobody needs to read all of this, so let's just keep going. But, uh, and then there are more specific directions for how we think the class ought to be organized. Uh, in this case, what to do to prepare the class uh, for the lesson, then uh, the kinds of things that will be done in class. And there's an extension activity here uh, for um, uh, teachers that want to go further with the issues in the in the lesson. Uh, then uh, we can go to the next page here. And there's a uh, there. Each lesson has a, a list, a vocabulary list of words that will crop up either in the, either in the essay or in the sources, uh, and some and the sources themselves are listed at the bottom of this page. Uh, so the uh, you can see I think that the that the Supreme Court case that's at issue here is Youngstown Sheet and, and Tube Company versus Sawyer, which was a um, case in which uh, President Harry Truman tried to uh, seize control of the steel industry during the middle of the Korean War and the issues that that raised. And, and then there are there are, are just two sources of uh, that follow that one from Hugo Black's uh, majority opinion and one from uh, the uh, dissent in that case. This page just shows standards that are the uh, American birthright standards that the lesson meets, and some additional sources for teacher enrichment books that are worth reading in connection with the, the issues here. So then uh, if we go to the next page, this is a, the typical background essay. It's two pages, typical background essay for uh, that appears for every one of the five courses that students will read. Uh, this one, um, uh, you know, dealing with the with the topic of the, um, you know, of the lesson. And uh, we, we can just scroll down through. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the, on the details of the, of the uh, 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 essay. It's a two page essay. And then this is a, there are three items in the sources. One of these is a, this is actually just a secondary source summary of the of the case that's at issue in this lesson, the Young Sun Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, um, in which uh, President Truman tried to, uh, you know, wanted to seize control of the um, steel industry, which was about to go on strike in the middle of uh, the Korean War. And uh, his feeling was that uh, it would jeopardize the, the war effort so seriously that he had to take over uh, the, the steel mills to keep them running. And uh, the steel co uh, companies went to court. Uh, they uh, uh, And the uh, case wound up before the Supreme Court. And um, the outcome was a 6-3 vote uh, that ruled that the president could not seize the steel mills without an act of Congress granting him that authority. And so then there are just, there's uh, Hugo Black's majority opinion. Uh, there's just a short, maybe about a one page as um, of text from that. Uh, anybody who's gone through Supreme Court cases know that they are very long and they're very detailed and they make references to all kinds of past uh, uh, 
uh, cases that are relevant. So it, what we've done here is just pick out the 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 basic issue that was uh, dealt with, and 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 this is the um, the the uh, majority opinion that basically said um, that the explained why the decision was that the uh, president didn't have the authority because uh, Congress had not. It was a legis. It took a legislative act to give him that authority. So he was essentially, according to them, um, invading the powers of Congress. And then uh, uh, Fred Vinson had a dissent to that, in which he refers to, um, which is what follows, starting at the bottom of this page and onto the next page. And uh, you know, basically saying that uh, look, the president has. A special powers as commander in chief, and there's plenty of precedent for his acting in this way in a hurry before he gets Congress's approval. Uh, so there's a uh, you know a fairly reasonable dissent to the decision that the majority took. So there's a lot to debate in these two uh, passages. Uh, then if we go on to next is is just the final um, set of instructions. This is the these are instructions that are given to the student. Uh, they have to read the uh, four questions below, uh, take some notes, maybe use an extra sheet of paper to write out their thoughts, and then uh, um, use them in a in a discussion to um, discussing the whole the whole case. And just to, I will read these. Uh, uh, just give you a sense of the way the questions are are set up. Uh, Justice Black thinks uh, the first question is Justice Black thinks President Truman violated one of the Constitution's key checks meant to limit the powers of each branch of the government. Explain which check he means and how he thinks the president violated it. And then uh, the second question: Justice Vincent in his dissent says. A, an emerg a national emergency gives the president the right to act on, on his own to meet the emergency. He refers to two parts of the Constitution, one establishing the president as commander-in-chief and one saying the president, quote, must take care to, that the laws be faithfully executed. Why do you think he believes these give the president the right to act as he did in this case? And then the third question do you think Justice Black deals with the points Justice Vinson makes in his dissent? Uh, and finally, do you think the Supreme Court majority opinion in this case was correct? Or do you think the dissenting opinion made a better argument? Explain your answer. So that's basically how this lesson is structured and how uh, the other four are structured. They all have uh, the same elements that I've just gone through. So I hope that gives you a, a, a good sense of how, um, yeah, how all these lessons are, are put together. Um, there, is a, there is a general pedagogical approach, I guess you might say, that I have, which is first to stress content, knowledge, facts, uh, that uh, it, it goes against my grain to just simply create a lesson in which students are invited to express their ideas and their views without having without having that background. So they always start off with the sign the student having to having to incorporate some some hopefully rich content. Uh, then uh, the lessons use primary sources as the evidence that students use to do the assignment and um, there's always a, fi a final task that is a mix of small group or individual assignments to assess, discuss, debate, write in response to prompts, directing them to specific features of the sources and to the background information in the lesson to help them summarize and think through and ask questions or debate conflicting views of specific passages in the source material. So that's how that's how the, uh, these five lessons are are set up. Uh, and uh, am I running? If I'm not running over time here, I I just give a few ideas about what where we're going with the whole course, at least as 
far as I understand that so far. I'm, um, I'm for it. Okay. Uh, the, the, um, the rest of the course will have for the, maybe the first half of the course will have a kind of chronological, uh, uh, framing, not, not very, not strictly chronological, but pretty close to that. Uh, and then the second part of it is more thematic. So the, in, in dealing with, uh, simply because it seems like there was a lot that happened in the 19th century that you have to follow in chronological order to understand how the nation was responding to its constitutional structure. So, um, uh, how American civic culture and society were, were shaped by increasing democracy, for example, or a growing market economy, uh, Western settlement, sectional strife, and its effects on the nature of federal state relations, uh, and the crisis over slavery. So that goes through the reconstruction. And then uh, there's a, a set of lessons that will deal with the late 19th century and the, the impact of industrial growth, massive immigration on American civic culture and political institutions, uh, the overseas acquisitions that came from the Spanish-American War, the fate of Native Americans, uh, the and then the impact of progressive reforms in the early 1900s and the emerging regulatory power of the federal government. Then from that point on, it's a, a, the, the idea would be uh, is to take a more thematic approach. There'll be lessons on the three branches in more, in more depth, one uh, including one on the growth of the administrative state and all of the uh, issues that, that are connected with that uh, a set of lessons on civil liberties, one each on the incorporation of the Bill of Rights under the 14th Amendment, freedom of expression, religious liberty, privacy, rights of the accused. Another set will look at equality in the civil rights movement, um, economic policy, education and social welfare, environment, and federalism, the relationship between the states and the national government now. Uh, there'll be a section on diplomacy, war, and peace in modern times. And finally, a section on citizenship, politics, and government. So uh, there's a little more detail that's been fleshed out for these lessons, but I won't go into that now I, uh, unless someone asks me to. So uh, that's my, those are my thoughts. Well, thank you so much. And look, it's wonderful to get the detailed sense of just what is in these lesson plans. And, and if, at some point, I may pretend to be a K-12 teacher to, to talk about that uh, aspect of it. But for now, uh, Steve McGuire, uh, would you be so kind as to give the first comment? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, thanks for that overview, Jonathan. Um, and thanks, uh, David, for inviting me to participate in this, this conversation. Um, yeah, I think this is a really uh, great resource, John, that you've put together. Um, going through the model lessons, they're all really impressive. They're, you know, as a, before I joined uh, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni (ACTA), I was a, a college professor. Uh, my background was in political science or uh, political theory, so I did teach, uh, you know, things like Intro to American Government uh, quite often, and I regularly taught courses in in political theory. So, um, certainly from that perspective. Uh, to see students coming into a college classroom who already had uh, this kind of education under their belt, uh, you know, would have been a great thing. And, uh, you know, some of the things I really like about the uh, the model lesson plan, and I'll talk about that for a few minutes, and then I, I want to talk about why I think doing things like this um, are so important, or is so important. But there's, uh, there's emphasis on uh, primary sources, Right. I think that's that's really important. Um, as a college professor, I always try to emphasize that as well. Um, you know, obviously, sometimes these historical sources can be uh, difficult uh, to read or they need to be uh, contextualized. But I, I do think as a teacher that it's important that students see with their own eyes uh, these primary sources and uh, what people uh, at the time were saying in their own words, what the documents actually say. 
uh, in their own words, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, I also really like how, uh, you know, when you look at the uh, the background essays that you've prepared and, and the various other materials, uh, I think especially because this is aimed at high school students, I like how it uh, it emphasizes the importance of these documents and the importance of, of the accomplishment, uh, you know, of, say, creating uh, the United States Constitution and giving students some appreciation, uh, you know, that these are uh, these are rare things. These were difficult things to accomplish. And, uh, you know, I, of course, I'm thinking about that uh, in relation to uh, contemporary efforts to you know, critique the Constitution or critique the founding fathers uh, or, or the American founding. And of course, uh, you know, it's perfectly fine uh, to offer criticisms uh, and to uh, investigate, you know, what were the individuals like? Uh, how did they conduct themselves? Uh, they're all human beings. So uh, safe to say they all have, uh, you know, personal failings just like uh, anybody else. Uh, but I, I think it's really important that students, especially coming up through K to 12, are uh, given a real appreciation for what they have inherited and, and what people who've come before them um, have, have given to them uh, really uh, through their efforts, even if, uh, you know, these things aren't uh, aren't entirely perfect. And so and I think that comes through in these these model lessons. Now, having said that, another thing I like about them is that you do offer students uh, different perspectives. So for instance, uh, you know, to use the, you didn't use it as, as your example, but the, uh, the module on the great compromise. And one of the assignments that you give to the students is, well, here's one, in, you know, it's a short perspective that you've summarized uh, quite nicely. Uh, you know, here is an argument sort of in favor of this, why this was a good thing or why it had to be done. And, and here's an argument against it. And then uh, not only that, but you give students a series of questions in the assignment that ask them to sort of consider each of those perspectives and, and to go back to the primary documents and other materials that you provided and try to almost uh, construct an argument in favor of each case, you know, using the, the resources uh, and the education that the students would, would have by the time that they turn to that assignment. And then finally, you of course, give them an opportunity to try and make uh, a case for which argument uh, they think is better. And you were, you were mentioning a minute ago, you know, about giving students an opportunity to express views. And I guess I, I would say two things there. One, I totally agree with you, you know, grounding the education in knowledge, grounding it in, in, in facts, um, in the arguments that were advanced by the participants at the time, that all seems like a critical prerequisite. And of course, we're all going to have our own sort of views and opinions at the end of the day, which is perfectly fine as well, but we would like those to be, to be informed. Uh, but then the other thing is that, you know, when you ask them to consider these arguments, uh, you're not necessarily just asking them, well, in your opinion, or, you know, uh, you know, which one do you feel is better or which one aligns with, you know, what you generally uh, would prefer, but you're kind of asking them to engage in the arguments. And uh, it reminds me of a, a time when I was teaching actually intro to American government at the college level. And I think I'd assigned the students to look at uh, two arguments in a Supreme Court case, and they had to write an essay uh, arguing, you know, which side they thought had the better argument. And I remember one student who was one of the more, uh, you know, gifted students in the class, uh, you know, he's a freshman, first semester freshman, and he came to me in my office and, and he said, well, you know, I agree with, with this justice, um, but I'm really having trouble writing my paper uh, because, you know, I'm just not finding much in there to base my argument on, whereas in the other piece, I'm finding lots of, uh, you know, interesting or useful, I forget how he put it, but what he was basically saying is, you know, in terms of his own personal uh, politics or what have you, you know, he he has, he sided with with the one justice, but when he went to actually analyze the decision, he thought the other justice was correct in this particular instance. And, it, you know, it was really fascinating. And I pointed out to him, I was like, look, you don't have to like change your whole political views here or anything like that. But what you're, what you're kind of learning here is that there's an opportunity to sort of follow an argument where it leads and, you know, possibly change your mind or, or maybe come up with a better argument for your side uh, in response to this argument that, that you've just learned. And so I see opportunities for students to do that um, in these lesson plans. And so, uh, you know, I think that's that's fantastic. And, and to have students come into a college classroom who 
a have the uh the knowledge that these uh modules would provide but also have some experience engaging in this kind of education and these kinds of arguments um you know that would just be really valuable because you know, honestly, one of the things I, I, I quite often found really every year was that most of the students, you know, they didn't know a lot um, and they were not really prepared to engage in these kinds of arguments, uh, you know, or, you know, maybe they um, had even taken an AP class. And still, a lot of the education that we ended up having to offer uh, was remedial, uh, you know, just covering uh, the basics because they weren't really re prepared. And, you know, it'd be ideal if they came in with more knowledge. And then when they took their first college class in American government, uh, what I was teaching or say American history, um, you know, they'd be prepared to go deeper, right? And, and, or, you know, move beyond maybe just mastering facts and start engaging more and more in kind of thoughtful analysis, uh, criticism, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, that kind of leads into why I think these kinds of efforts uh, are, are so important. And, uh, you know, at ACTA, we've in the past routinely done civic surveys, and, you know, the results of these surveys are invariably disappointing, right? We find that uh, the respondents often do not know uh, basic facts about the American system of government uh, or about American history. And, uh, you know, when you narrow it down to, say, college graduates, uh, the results are still not great. So, you know, just a couple of examples. This is from a, a 2019 survey that ACTA did. Uh, we found that uh, less than half of college graduates uh, knew the term lengths of U.S. senators uh, and representatives, right? Uh, only 12% of the respondents overall knew that it was the 13th Amendment uh, that freed slaves in the United States. 30% thought the Equal Rights Amendment was what guaranteed uh, women the right to vote. And of course, other organizations ask, uh, you know, test civics knowledge among Americans on a regular basis. Uh, a good example is the uh, Annenberg Public Policy Center uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, I note that in your in your modules, one of the things, of course, that you teach them is about the different uh, branches of government. And uh, in Annenberg's, I think this is their most recent survey uh, from, from 2023. I think they release these actually every year right around uh, Constitution Day. Um, and they found that only two thirds of respondents could name all three branches of the United States government. Right. Which is, you know, that's obviously extremely, uh, extremely basic knowledge um, about our government. Um, you, you know, just even knowing what they are, let alone understanding why they're three or what the powers of each of them are or how they have historically uh, related to one another, uh, that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, we we just have all this survey data that shows us that uh, that Americans uh you know, lack basic knowledge about their government. Um, and then at the same time, uh, we have sort of alternative approaches to civics education. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, you know, a lot of civics education, a lot of college level political science education focuses on engagement, right? There's this, the overarching goal is trying to get students to be engaged as opposed to teaching them knowledge and history and, and understanding. Uh, of the way that our, our system of government works, or uh, you know, efforts like the 1619 project, and of course, again, there's uh, there's plenty of room to uh, criticize the history of the United States, to criticize uh, the American system of government or or the founding fathers, um, but uh, you know, when we're especially when we're talking about K to 12 education, uh, as I was saying earlier, I think we really want to have students coming away understanding that even if the American system of government and American history isn't perfect, that there really is something uh, fundamentally good here. And that, uh, you know, when we look at what we have, especially relative to, say, um, historical perspective, um, it really is uh, quite an amazing accomplishment. And that should be communicated uh, to young Americans. They should have a kind of... Um, pride in their country and and then criticisms you know should come sort of in addition to that uh or on top of that now um in terms of you know further in terms of why this matters so i work primarily on on campus freedom issues in higher education and uh you know this is an area where we regularly uh i think see in the news uh the results of people uh students not having an adequate uh, education in our system of government, and uh, you know, especially 
in the Bill of Rights. Um, going back to the Annenberg survey I mentioned, uh, they said, uh, you know, when they asked respondents about the First Amendment, right, of course, most of them couldn't uh, name the five rights that are guaranteed in the First Amendment. The one that did get uh, a decent level of, of response uh, was freedom of speech. 77% uh, were able to name that. Um, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that people understand, uh, you know, what the First Amendment protects or what, what their right to free speech uh, entails. Uh, in, in 2023 as well, uh, the University of Wisconsin system did a survey of their students. And this is really a great idea, actually. This is something that we recommend that universities do at ACTA. You know, universities will regularly survey their communities, their students, faculty, staff about the climate on campus. But usually the questions will be, you know, say about, uh, you know, DEI type stuff, you know, do you feel like you belong? And then there'll be other stuff about resources on campus and that sort of thing. Rarely do these surveys ask anything about the climate for free expression or the state of uh, diversity of thought uh, on campus. And so it really is great. The University of Wisconsin did this massive survey of students in their entire system and asked them a bunch of questions uh, about free expression, you know, not unlike the annual survey that uh, FIRE does, where they ask students at a variety of colleges around the country. Um, and, you know, it had some revealing uh, results. So um, about a third of the students in the University of Wisconsin system said they thought they had been taught something about the First Amendment. Right. So I think that there is, is notable as an example. If only a third of the students are receiving an education about the First Amendment in college. Now, maybe some of these respondents would go on to get one still like they're not all they all haven't graduated yet. But still, right, that's a, that's a third of students. And if they're not being properly educated about it in K to 12 either, uh, then where are Americans going to learn um, about their First Amendment rights? Um, and then they asked them about, they asked them a couple of questions about hate speech. And obviously, I'm not advocating for hate speech um, or, or anything like that. But, uh, you know, the United States is a kind of rare exception in the world where our First Amendment uh, jurisprudence has, uh, you know, interpreted the First Amendment quite broadly to protect things that most people would regard um, as hate speech. And uh, when they asked the students in the University of Wisconsin system, whether uh, the First Amendment allowed their universities to ban hate speech, 32% uh, said yes, so about a third, 26% uh, said no, and 42% were unsure, right? So it just highlights again that, that students don't know, and, and this, isn't, uh, this isn't their fault, right? If they're not getting taught it by their college professors and they're not being taught it in high school, right? Maybe they hear about it somewhere else, um, but more likely than not, they're just not going to know about it, right? And what are the consequences of students not knowing these things? I mean, I don't know if you could attribute all of the, the shout downs and the increasing illiberalism that we see on our campuses to lack of civics education, but I think that's that's a big part of it, right? And uh, at ACT, our, our What Will They Learn project looks at the core curriculum or general education requirements at colleges and universities around the country. And we find that less than 20% of colleges and universities require their students to take a course in American government or American history, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of students, you know, it's a great uh, chance that they will, you know, get whatever education they get at the high school level, and then that could be it as far as formal education in uh, American government history. And, uh, you know, just, I, you know, I don't want to pick on the University of Wisconsin at Madison, although perhaps somewhat easy to do. Uh, you know, the, I, again, it's, it's great that they did the survey, but, uh, you know, I was looking at FIRE's campus uh, disinvitation database, and, you know, just in the last couple of years, uh, you know, they have eight to 10 uh, major disruption events uh, in this database, which is quite a high number relative to other campuses, right? And so you have uh, students who are sort of you know, rallying to disinvite controversial speakers and in some cases uh, to shout them down. And of course, we've we've seen high uh, profile instances of that uh, regularly on our campuses. Uh, you know, quite famously now, uh, Judge uh, uh, Duncan was, was shouted down at Stanford Law School, right? One of our nation's top law schools. Uh, we've all just seen in the news recently uh, the incident where uh, students were uh, trying to protest at the home of Dean Kemerinsky at Berkeley uh, Law School. Um, 
Just the other day, Ann Coulter was reinvited to speak at Cornell University, and the talk was able to uh, to go on. Uh, but she had been reinvited because she had been shouted down there back in the fall of 2022. And uh, even this time around, uh, a professor uh, started interrupting during the Q and A and had to be removed and I believe arrested. Uh, you know, for for disrupting the event. So, uh, you know, we see all kinds of signs uh, of liberalism on our campuses, and uh, that's without even starting to really get into um, much of what we've seen uh, since Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th uh, and uh, the you know discourse about settler colonialism, uh, you know, which is often revealed uh, is not just about Israel, but it's also about America, too, um, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, but if you don't give students uh, a foundational education, right, then that space might get filled by other things or other perspectives, right? I mean, another great example is uh, uh, recently, you know, there was this uh, phenomenon on TikTok where people were talking about Osama, one of Osama bin Laden's letters and people were saying, oh, their minds were blown. Osama bin Laden was so right. I mean, you know, anybody who was properly educated about 9-11 and what happened on that day and, you know, all of the events leading up to it and after, you, you know, you just wouldn't be able uh, to say that. So, um, you know, I, I just want to say that uh, you know, I really once again, I really think that this is uh, an amazing resource uh, that you've put together. I think it's something that uh, American students uh, need, and you know, I think the the kinds of things that we're seeing on our on our college campuses and then beyond into the media uh, and elsewhere uh, just really illustrate that um, you know we need to do a better job educating students uh, to understand. Uh, how amazing our system of government is and sort of the spirit of that system of government and and how to participate in it. So thanks. Lovely. Thank you so much. And then we'll go on to Alex, uh, Alex Dister from Parents Defending Education. Hi, um, thank you so much for having me. It is uh, really wonderful to be included here. Uh, we love working with National Association of Scholars and the Civics Alliance. Um, because you guys are actively working to provide solutions for schools and for teachers. Um, I know you mentioned we don't have a teacher on the call, but I'm the daughter of two teachers. My mom has taught in public schools for over 30 years, and my dad taught um, uh, government and economics at the high school that I went to. And especially now, as we're seeing teachers being asked to be emotional counselors, truancy officers, um, and teach, they need support and they need resources like this um, provided by the National Association of Scholars and the Civics Alliance. You guys are really stepping in to fill those gaps. So we're so grateful for that. Um, I don't think this will surprise any of, any of you to say that we are facing a grave crisis in our institutions, including our system of education, K-12 education. Um, students aren't meeting basic benchmarks in reading, writing, math, science, social studies, and also civics. Um, I know Steve uh, mentioned some really, really great and insightful statistics, not great statistics, but it's good information um, about something very bad that is happening in our schools. Um, Last year on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, um, on the, the history test scores, just 13% of eighth graders scored at or abro above proficiency in history, and only 22% of eighth graders were at or above proficiency in civics. And I think many people look at that and will immediately attribute that to the pandemic and school closures. And while that certainly does have something to do with the decline in test scores we're seeing across the board, um, this really is not a new issue. It's not new since the pandemic. Um, in 2018, there were just 15% of eighth graders meeting or surpassing proficiency in civics. So I think that that shows that it's not just entirely, uh, you know, the fault of virtual learning, although, of course, that that definitely played a role, too. Um, and that's, you know, again, not even to speak of scores in the fundamental basic skill of reading, which is obviously quite necessary to learn and understand civics and other very complex topics. Um, I remember one time, I think this was even before I was in high school, but my dad um, 
I remember him talking about over the dining room table, teaching kids to read in high school. He was a high school teacher and had to do remedial after school, uh, you know, reading courses for his kids who could not sit in a class when they were asked to read um, and read from the textbook. I think that's very frightening. So what's going on instead? If kids are being taught these very basic fundamental things, what is actually happening in schools? I think that's something that PDE has worked tirelessly to uncover. And there are several pro problems at play here. And I'll just mention a few. First, we have the war on merit and lowering the bar for kids. The removal of standardized tests as a threshold for getting into elite high schools like Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in Virginia, also at the university level. And it's pretty, you know, I don't find it super surprising that over the past couple of weeks, a few top universities have decided to bring back those tests, which I believe in 2020, they eliminated, um, you know, chalking it up to racism and what have you. You also see the elimination of gifted and talented programs in the name of equity, which of course hurts all students um, and takes a vital opportunity away from them. Relatedly, I think you see uh, just general shift, uh, shifting time in the classroom to cover topics like social emotional learning, divisive race and gender ideology, ethnic studies, action civics, which can replace time in the classroom studying history with political activism. Um, we see schools teaching children that our country is fundamentally flawed and racist. Instead of teaching that while individuals are flawed, our constitution has done more to advance freedom and liberty than any other founding document in the history of the world. And that is something worth celebrating. Instead, kids are being taught a fundamentally anti-Western, anti-American point of view. Um, as bad as you know our higher education system is right now, um, it's clear that students aren't just showing up to college campuses um, and just magically they're learning these chants like death to Israel and death to America. That's something that unfortunately and very frighteningly um, those ideas are being inculcated in K-12 schools, especially as Steve mentioned, we're seeing incidents post-October 7th teaching kids that Israel is a you know genocidal apartheid state um, in the U.S. as well as complicit in, in colonialism and what have you. Um, but, you know, kids are not being taught that it's worth celebrating the advances we've made to live up to our promises of being a country that protects and defends liberty and justice for all, it's worth celebrating the leaps and bounds we've made as a country to treat one another as equals under the law, uh, not just subject to the whims and wills of a king or dictator, but you know we have a say in, in the forming of our government. Um, unfortunately, that's not what kids are hearing, and it's why it's so important now and always to provide lessons like this. Um, you know, we see near daily headlines questioning the rule of law in our country, assuming guilt rather than innocence, condemning people in the court of public opinion before his or her case has even been heard. Uh, students are not learning about the importance of the rule of law and impartial judiciary, the presumption of innocence and the separation of powers, which is fundamental to our system. And now we have schools cozying up to genocidal dictators like Xi Jinping in the Chinese Communist Party. That's not a joke. Um, NAS has done incredible work tracking Confucius Institutes in at the university level. Uh, Parents Defending Education last summer released a report that found that 143 school districts across the country had fostered ties with the Chinese Ministry of Education or other CCP-affiliated entities over the course of about a decade. Schools are asking students to use TikTok in lessons. They're contracting with tutor.com. Um, obviously, the, the parent companies of both are based in China, um, and we know the issues with Chinese law compelling them to assist in data collection efforts. Um, and then in November, we have Xi Jinping, who, you know, as we know from a document dump in the New York Times, helped orchestrate this genocide that we were seeing against the Uyghurs. Um, he announced he's ready to bring 50,000 American students to China over the course of the next five years. So why does this matter? Um, we're seeing before our eyes a foreign adversary and the American education system actively working in lockstep to unseat the United States as the world's first and foremost military and economic superpower. This is intentional. Uh, it's intended to soften future you know, American businessmen, politicians, and leaders to CCP aims. Um, and American schools are doing much of the legwork for them by telling kids that, hey, the U.S., we're not so great after all. 
And we cannot let that happen for freedom, for human rights, both here and abroad. So what is the solution? We can pass good laws to ensure that state and federal taxpayer dollars are not being used to discriminate uh, students and teachers on the basis of race. We can tie funding prohib prohibitions to discriminatory practices like DEI. We can support transparency in schools to ensure that families have access to the materials their children are learning. Uh, we can try to block China ties to our schools. And these are all good things. I think they're all nonpartisan things and ideas and principles that until very recently, most people supported. Um, and having policy on our side, obviously, is, is good, uh, a good thing when we can get it. Uh, but fundamentally, though, I think a big part of our fight is going to happen outside of the sphere of politics. It's in our schools and our communities. We have to demand more from our schools. And yes, I'm saying we, we can't abandon our public schools. As good as school choice programs are, we know that most kids would still go to public schools even with perfect school choice. So I think providing good apolitical instruction in our schools is probably in many ways a much harder fight than changing our laws. Um, if I've learned one thing from living in Washington, D.C. and watching, watching politics over the past few years, it's that it's easier to tear down than it is to build. And NAS has taken it upon itself, the task of building. And for that, I'm so grateful. Building demands more of people. It demands more of NAS, of teachers, of students. And that's the challenge that we have to take on. Um, but when NAS creates these amazing resources and standards, I think that makes the fight that much easier. Um, I think what's particularly great about these lessons, is, as Steve and Jonathan have mentioned, um, they present the facts. They ask kids to look at those facts to debate, to discuss, and to draw their own conclusions. It's so simple. It's something we expect from our school system, and yet we know um, that that standards like this are necessary because that's not happening. Instead, kids are being uh, forced to believe different or accept different uh, political ideologies that are being taught in schools instead of learning the facts and drawing their own conclusions from them. So again, I'm so grateful that the NAS has invited PDE to be here. Um, it's important to have good friends in this fight. We really do need each other here. Um, and you know, being here with people like you, even virtually, gives me so much hope for the future of the American education system because day to day gets pretty grim. Uh, you know, just seeing all these different incidents pop up. But in closing, I'm so grateful for NAS for our friendship, and I'm excited to be part of this event and more broadly the fight for our schools. Thank you so much. Now, this is the point where I encourage everybody who's uh, watching, put in your questions so that we can have this be a QA. and a um, I will start with, oh, uh, this is perhaps an unfair question, but John, if you had had a sixth lesson on the Constitution, what would you have had it be on? And, 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 I, should, and I, I, no, I, I ask this because here in the background, we know every teacher with great sympathy has to make choices. It's wonderful to be able to do a week in the Constitution. Obviously, you'd love to have a semester on it. Um, and, you know, we all when we lose, we know we lose essential things when we make the, these choices. But teachers do have to make choices. But and just to get a sense, what would be like your sixth lesson on the Constitution? <laughs> I don't know if I have an easy answer for that. Um, it 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 might have something to do with uh, the the uh, issue of how the Constitution has been per perceived over time, and uh, but I haven't. I, I'd have to think about that. For, you caught me off guard on that. I don't know what uh, what I, I'm sure. There's a lot of things I left out of what I did and. Um, a sixth lesson. Give me a chance to think about that a bit. Well, I will actually, I mean, all right, so I will actually. Did, like, did you have something in mind about that? that? Myself and just maybe and brought <laughs> that to the other two. What are things people really need to know? Um, that the First Amendment includes freedom of religion and not just freedom of speech. And I must say, that's actually terribly important, I think, that in a great number of places, you know, when they do do these Constitution Week things, they have freedom of speech, but they've sort of yeah. gotten rid of every other part of the First Amendment. And I think actually sort of a broad reading of everything in the First Amendment 
including freedom of religion, is I think terribly in you know, freedom of assembly and so on. Is, is I'm looking at, I hope I'm getting my amendments right. Is a terribly uh, important to have. And I guess is there actually like. I'll broaden that. Is there something which, in effect, even people who think they have some immediate knowledge of the Constitution, they ought to have as like the second thing they ought to know, but don't quite have? To either and both of um, Steve and Alex. You know, well, what, I mean, there's so many things. About, can... Oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. Oh, well, I just wasn't going to say uh, one of the sections of the of the course we're envisioning would be um uh a, a look at the uh, way in which the you know pretty much all of the elements of the bill of rights have have been uh, developed in the 20th century civil liberties in the modern age and religious liberty would be one of those lessons uh because i agree with you i think that's that's an that is one aspect of the first amendment that doesn't get that gets short shrift and it you know obviously it involves two different issues, religious, the establishment of religion versus religious liberty and, and how you balance those issues, those two issues out. So, so yeah, I think we will get to that. Thank you. And Steve one that came to mind for me would be the, uh, you know, how elections are conducted, the electoral college, uh, in particular, yeah. uh, maybe later amendments to the constitution, uh, you know, the, the bill of rights is in there, but, uh, to cover later ones, uh, maybe units, um, I mean, this would be three more, but one looking at each of the, uh, branches of the, of the national government and sort of looking at in more detail, the powers that they have and, and how they've developed over time, uh, you know, like a lesson on, um, how the Supreme Court has developed its role and, you know, how it established uh, its power of judicial review. Um, you know, I think that that's a really uh, important thing for Americans to know. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of different lessons you could add if you were going to, you know, start adding to this. But I think what John's put there is is excellent. We, You know, I, just to generally, the, my concept of this course that we're uh, uh, beginning to think about creating is that it would the these five lessons were, are are sort of a uh, an introduction and the course will circle back to the constitution constantly uh and especially when when with regard to the last hundred years or so the 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 ways in which our society has evolved and the complex challenges that poses to um keeping the constitutional order functioning the way it was intended to function. And Alex, can I buttonhole you on this question? Sure. I would just like to reiterate what you said on the Supreme Court cases. I think that was a very interesting part of my own AP history um, course uh, class that I took in high school. And I think that's very helpful to understand. I mean, especially in terms of free speech, the different court cases that have kind of steered what what is free speech and what is and I find that personally very interesting but I'm also not the the best scholar to ask on that so that's just my personal opinion sure um all right so as I say still encouraging questions from the audience but clearly part of what is needed is also adult education because what everybody's talking about is in effect people of all a generation or two has come out of the schools not knowing this I guess, what are our thoughts, your thoughts, about how one can best do education of the Constitution for adults to complement, supplement, or, you know, take the place of just what wasn't provided in the school so that adults have a good knowledge of the Constitution? 20 and all. <laughs> I'll I mean, one thing about schools is you you sort of have a captive audience, as they say, yeah. right? I mean, the students yeah. are enrolled, they're going to be taking the classes uh, with adults. Uh, you know, you're looking for, you know, people who are probably going to, you know, volunteer to learn more. I mean, I can certainly say uh, when I was at uh, Villanova, I ran a center there, uh, the Matthew J. Ryan Center, and we routinely put on uh, public events, uh, including an annual Constitution Day lecture uh, for the university. And, and we would advertise these as widely as we possibly could to the local community. And, 
you know, I think universities and colleges in general um, are places that, you know, they don't just serve their immediate campus communities, but they serve, you know, the broader community around them. And uh, certainly in, uh, you know, when we're able to do things like this via via Zoom, you know, a lot of these events are put online and anybody can can watch them. So that's certainly one thing is for colleges and universities, uh, centers there that are committed to civic mm -hmm. education, uh, to organize events and other kinds of programming uh, that they can open up to the general public. I was just going to um, emphasize that and uh, have a shameless plug for my alma mater. Uh, Hillsdale has online courses on the Constitution. Um, I have not taken those because I had to take that in college. Um, but I think that's a really good resource. And I know other other colleges and universities offer similar programming online. And I believe many are for free. So. Hmm. Um, and, sorry, and John, did you want to speak on this or? Uh, no, I, I really, you know, it's a it, <laughs> that's a, a you're asking very difficult questions. I mean, the uh, the points Steve made about the fact that you have a trap you have a, a captured audience with with schools and how you reach the adult population uh w unless it's really uh, people that are out there looking for the opportunity it's hard to know exactly uh how you would do it other than yeah i, I do think what hillsdale does is is one uh, you know one way to do it Thank you. Well, in that case, I'm going to have a specific question for you, which is actually you know, sources for teacher enrichment. And, and this is, I think, really important because half the battle is teacher education. It's not just student education. It's teaching the teachers you know, what they need to know. And, and in fact, the American birthright standards are meant to be you know, serving that function also. But, you know, for example, in that lesson two that you were concentrating on, on the Constitution's checks and balances, you chose in particular, and I'll just read the, some of the titles for people, you know, Emmy Bradford, Original Intentions on the Making and Ratification of the United States Constitution. Bruce Fronin, The American Republic, Primary Sources, an excellent work. Donald S. Lutz, uh, The Origins of American Constitutionalism. Yeah, then primary source, James Madison, Federalist Number 51. Charles de Montesquieu, The Spirit of the Laws. And then, of course, Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company, the entire case. I, I guess particularly I'm asking, what about Bradford's original intentions and Lutz's origins of American constitutionalism made you choose those as two secondary sources for teacher enrichment? I have to go back and look at what was in that lesson, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it, it, that was sort of a helter-skelter looking through things that seemed relevant to the particulars of the lesson. Um but uh, what I don't know what's it what's the I'm not sure what the point is that you're making. Oh, about, I guess I'm sorry. This is part of part of what we need to have is for teachers is to have a sense of what are the good secondary sources for them to get acquainted yeah. with as they teach the students. You know, they should be teaching the. So I guess what should teachers be looking for in secondary sources that will be most enriching to them as they um you know try to you. Know, prepare themselves to teach a UI high school civics course. Yeah, it's uh, I think it's a hard question because those are you know, they're scholarly resources they they require as it's not they're not something easy to get into and and uh, you have to be motivated to do it. So uh you know, I'm not sure. Well, in that case, perhaps I'll switch to Steve on the same question, just because uh, you, you have taught this on the college level. So when you're looking for secondary sources, for, you know, and I must say, some of your students presumably were future K-12 teachers in social studies, and you must have thought, what is the thing that's going to be enriching them as they did that? How did you think in terms of you know, what sort of secondary sources should they be reading? Yeah, well, I mean, you're looking for, uh, you know, obviously you know, some of the, the best sources recognized by, by scholars or experts in a particular field. Um, and so, you know, I, my, like I said, my field was political theory, so I wasn't even a, an expert uh, in, in American government. Um, but, you know, there would be certain um, 
scholarly resources or secondary sources that would sort of constantly emerge. Or I see someone in the chat mention Gordon Wood. Like, yes, like obviously someone like Gordon Wood, whatever you're teaching, if Gordon Wood has written about it, you're going to probably go look at that, uh, you know, and, and see what he has to say. Uh, but then the other thing too is to look for sources that, uh, you know, depending on how advanced you want to get, right? Uh, looking at sources that, uh, are sort of representatives of, of famous schools of interpretation or famous schools of thought, right? Um, you know, for instance, um, you know, this isn't a, an interpretation that I would personally recommend, but you think about like Charles Beard's economic interpretation of the Constitution, uh, you know, that's uh, that's certainly something that's been influential. So I would think that at, at a certain level of uh, advanced study, you know, a teacher uh, or a scholar would would want to know about that and, and consider it, even if they didn't uh, agree with it or, or endorse it, right? Uh, but, you know, as far as like, you know, sources for preparing and teaching lessons like the one that uh that that John has has prepared here you know i think you'd be looking more for these sort of classic solid scholarly treatments of these um topics by by sort of well-known renowned historians uh and political scientists and I, I might even say, Alex, when, when you were taking these courses, you remember any? Do you remember any particular secondary sources that struck you as particularly impressive as a student? That's a really good question. I mean, you're asking me to go back like eight years now, yeah, so terrible. that's quite a quite a task. Um, I'm just trying to think. We had, um, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just plugging Hillsdale again, but their um, Constitution reader as well as their Western Heritage Reader, have selections from all sorts of, of different things. So I would point to that. A lot of that's going to be primary source materials, though. So, gosh, I'm not sure. Okay. I will go to questions. And I, I confess, actually, my questions had wandered off my screen for a minute or two. Please forgive me. Uh, there's a question from Tom, or indeed Tom's iPhone. Uh, with the enormous amount of power delegated to the administrative state by Congress and the executive governing by fiat via executive orders, are we now in a post-constitution state? And I, I guess I would actually say that there is then the serious question. I'll, I'll just push on that. We are describing the Constitution as it should be in practice and how it is in practice may depart somewhat from that. How much should we be teaching students about how the Constitution is operating in practice, even if, with this is how should we put it, cutting against how it should be operating in practice? John, well, uh, you I know, in, in, in the, the outline that we have for the, the course we're thinking of is, is includes uh, a a, at least one lesson on the administrative, the growth of the administrative state, and I think you, that's a, a and that's where the question you're asking really rises and really uh, is a challenge. You know, do we have we created a fourth branch of of government that, uh, and what do we do about that? And it, it seems like that's an issue that's becoming more salient too these days, and and. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a I think it's a real challenge for for um you know any overall look at the at the constitution. How you know how has our uh are we at a point where it's becoming you know, I sometimes think of what I'm doing as as a an act of restoration for a future day that uh we'll get back to the basics, but we seem to have departed from them considerably. So I think that has to be dealt with. I think th there has to be the, uh, the course has to, has to contend with the fact that conditions have changed and there are many people who think the constitution is um, antiquated and uh, I think they're wrong. And, you know, we have to try to um, contend with that though in the, the way we teach about this. Um, other people on this question, the administrative state in particular, 
Well, I certainly appreciate the question. I would I would personally, uh, you know, not go so far as to say we're in a post constitutional state. Um, I would say that yes, learning about the bureaucracy, uh, you know, is important, and understanding. I mean, I, I you know, there's a lot of. Uh, people who are probably even uh, fairly advanced in their understanding of our system of government who probably don't quite understand how much power the bureaucracy has or, or how it works and how decisions are, are really made um, once you, especially once you get into the particulars of any uh, piece of legislation that authorizes the bureaucracy to do something. Um, so, so yes, by all means, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, by the time you get to the college level too, raising questions about how the administrative, uh, you know, branch works, uh, I'll call it the administrative branch, um, and, uh, you know, how it interacts with the the executive branch of which it is, uh, you know, a part and all of that sort of thing uh, is is very important. And I think these are, you know, critical issues for us as citizens to, to think about and, and to address. Having said all that, um, you know, I, I think that it's still important for uh, Americans and young Americans to understand the the origins of our constitutional system and understand, um, you know, how it was designed, uh, why it was designed the way that it was. Um, you know, maybe there's different uh, interpretations uh, of what it was intended to do, you know, or what certain particulars were intended to, to be like, but uh, that as far as possible, they should understand what the original intentions uh, behind that are. And I, I think, you know, a challenge that, that we have today is figuring out how to sort of carry forward uh, the spirit of our constitutional system of government, uh, despite the various historical changes uh, that have taken place, or, or maybe, you know, even in conjunction with them insofar as, you know, we're not going back to some uh, constitutional promised land where everything operates, you know, uh, you know, say in a, in a post New Deal world or, or whatever, you know, uh, marker you want to identify. Um, you know, in the uh, in one of the lessons that we've done, the, one of those five lessons, uh, students are asked to contend with the debates between federalists and anti-federalists, and with regard to to the question of how much power the the federal government was going to have in relation to the states, and it it seems to me even in that even at that time. There was the the debate. The anti-federalists had concerns that I think have become more relevant in our age in terms of their. I I think they were they were wrong at the time about the dangers of a too powerful federal government, but I think they anticipated changes that we we've, we've uh, we're contending with now. Yeah, and Alex, do you want to contribute to this or? Uh... Um, I don't have much to add other than, as I mentioned in the chat, I feel very frightened when you have uh, members of Congress who can't even name the, the three branches of government, nonetheless, understand properly their roles. So just to add that. Yeah, I guess I'll just add, I mean, when you're talking about the administrative state, I mean, in fact, it's so vast that purely as a teaching question, you need to think about what to concentrate on. And I guess I would say one way to think about you know, that there is the Administrative Procedures Act of 1946, which supercharges in general administrative law. But I guess I would mm -hmm. say that you need to focus on a few key const uh, institutions. And I will um, say you know, the Federal Reserve, for example, is an institution of very great power over the economy. Um, if I were to talk about the ad administrative state, I, I might, I think, talk about the delegation of power to the Federal Reserve as, you know, you know one lesson plan, <laughs> but yes, it's something to focus on. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm going to go to a, a question, which is, I think, somewhat hostile in intent, but, you know, let, let, let's you know, mention, you know, Professor Christopher Cruz, um, well, this is a long one, but you know, he is a college professor, teaches politics and history. He has a survey in which he says that, you know, uh, apparently Republicans are in favor of, you know, 
some sort of, you know, because the things have gotten so far off track in this country, you need a leader who is willing to break some rules if that's what it takes to set things right. Among the strongest support for the American birthright standards and the civics work NAS is promoting typically comes from conservatives. What can we do to address this growing distrust of basic democratic institutions and support for anti-democratic politics among many conservatives and independents? And how might we address these in civics education in particular? Now, I have, have a spiel I would, could use to answer this, including some of its assumptions, but it's a question. People, how would you answer this question? Anyone want to go first? I want to hear your spiel. Ha. All right. Uh, I think that, <laughs> I mean, frankly, that I think that the departure from the Constitution comes far more from so-called progressives who have simply yeah. subordinated the Constitution to whatever is their political priority of the day. Uh, and then that democratic institutions and de you know, de anti-democratic politics, this is the language of the left when they have something which is unconstitutional and unrepublican, and frankly, they simply want to impose it without um, you know, any you know, pushback from you know, the people and you know, by their delegated lawmakers, then they say, this is anti, you know, ooh, we hate you, you're anti-democratic, and therefore you must be you know, banned. And what they call demo, in effect, what they call democratic is usually left authoritarian. What they call, you know, some word of opprobrium, we'll say anti-democratic, usually means liberal and democratic and republican. And in effect, so this would be the rant uh, I would say against Ginhim, uh, which of course leaves us at the basic argument that in effect there, you know, there are basic. The political arguments about civics education are obviously terrifically important. Conservatives and liberals do tend to align with different views of what civics education should be. And I guess I will go forward to say, this is the sort of argument we're going to be getting. And having given my sort of counter polemic against him, which you know, is, is, I think all true, um, I would want to say that what we are offering is, you know, what John and you know, and Steve in particular have been actually, sorry, and Alex, all of you have been emphasizing primary sources and the ability to debate from multiple points of view. Um, we do firmly believe that this is the best education for all Americans and that it can serve Americans of every political point of view. Every, I mean, I will put it practically that originalism began affiliated with the right. There is now a vigorous strain of left originalism often being used to critique you know, uh, decisions by a conservative Supreme Court majority. It is, I must say, actually delightful that the left is now adopting originalism to make their arguments. This, I think, makes for a better <laughs> republic. Um, I do think that this is a point, I think, by, um, what's his name? Ellis, I think. Um, American common identity and love of our institutions has been founded by a common debate about the Constitution. You know, we are, are people because we argue about the words we hold in common and how they ought to be interpreted. I think that allegiance and love to America and to the Constitution, both on left and right, is best supported by a firm education in these primary sources themselves, you know, the foundation, a foundation of our national identity, and in the basic ability to argue in good faith. You know, if you can learn how to do that in class with generosity of, of spirit, you can do that. You're, you're better equipped to do that as an adult and it will enable us to maintain a basic love and loyalty to America and your know, affection to the people we disagree with as fellow Americans. And I guess that's what I would say is my argument for the basic pedagogical approach of what we're doing. And I really do think mm -hmm. that should appeal to everyone across the political spectrum.
So that's my, my more sophisticated answer to uh, Mr. Cruz, Professor Cruz. Well, I mean, I, I agree with you. My, my uh, you know, my attitude about this is in the in designing lessons is that you have to trust people's capacity for reason. And uh, which means you have to you have to provide them with the material that they can work on on their own, but set it up in such a way that they're that they are pushed to to reason things out. And rather than I mean, when you talk about the the rhetoric that's out there now about uh, the threats to democracy, you see you see hyperbole on both sides, I think, about that. And, and I agree with you, particularly on the left people defending in the name of democracy, all kinds of uh, things that seem quite authoritarian to me. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 in terms of what you do in the schools, I think that you have to have faith that, you have to have faith in people's capacity to reason. If you set the, the parameters of the, uh, correctly, they'll, uh, to keep them in focused on, on each other's actual substantive arguments, uh, you have to trust them to to um, arrive at their own conclusions. So you know when I when I create the lessons, I I I usually you know have a side myself, but uh, uh, I have to work very hard at making sure that doesn't that doesn't um, you know that I. I, I did a series of lessons once in which one of the, the, the they always ended up with a debate. And one of the rules of the debate was that um, uh, st the students on side A would uh, get to go first, side B would listen to the argument, and side B would then have the requirement of repeating the argument back to side A such that side A agreed they had stated their position accurately. And then you do the same thing with the other side. So they they had to really listen to each other's arguments and respond directly to the content of those arguments. And uh, it doesn't seem to me like that happens very much when when people debate with each other. They they usually, if they're if they are actually at odds with each other, they don't really listen very well. So so I think that's what you have to do. Right? You have to you have to set set the material up in such a way that people are uh, disciplined to to reason to reason things through with uh, some understanding. So I could just add uh, too. I mean, it, it is an interesting question, and yes, there's certainly some you know assumptions uh, that could be. Uh, debated there. Um, but this idea that things have gone off track, uh, another thing that we see repeatedly in polls, especially among conservatives, but among Americans more generally, is declining trust or confidence in institutions, including um, our educational institutions, right? Uh, Gallup's uh, poll last August showed that, you know, 36% of Americans said they have confidence in American higher education, which was the lowest number they'd seen since they started polling, I think maybe a decade and a half ago or something like that, maybe a bit longer. Um, but I think there's, you know, there may be many reasons that uh, self-identified conservatives or Republicans would say that things have gotten very far off track. Uh, I think one of those is this sense that our institutions um, aren't doing uh, what they're supposed to be doing. And so I, I think model lessons like this and, and embracing them and using them is exactly the kind of thing that for some of those Republicans, even ones who might say we need a leader who's going to break some rules. Well, what do they want the leader to do? Like, why? Do, what do they want him to break the rules for? And you could argue, well, to restore uh, institutions. I don't know. Maybe that seems naive to some people, but I I, I do think that um, you know, when it comes to educational institutions, uh, 
um, I, I would bet that a lot of people answering these polling questions in those ways would actually be quite pleased to see model lessons like this being offered uh, to their kids in school. And that would actually go some of the distance towards uh, perhaps changing the way uh, that they might answer a survey question like that in the future. And, and yeah, I, and I think that applies uh, to conservatives or Republicans, but, but also to others as well. Uh, that's what the polling data, you know, seems to support. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I think I, I too am, am very afraid by both extremes on both sides who do not, uh, who want to not play by the rules, whether they hate the Constitution, whether they think we are beyond the Constitution, what have you. But I also think a fundamental um, uh, solution or solution to this fundamental problem is like what Steve mentioned. We have to make our institutions actually accountable. And I think for so long, they have not been um, accountable in part because you have an executive branch who or really the legislature who's legislated away their powers to a bureaucratic um, executive branch who can can kind of just push whatever sort of policies they want through executive order. So um, I think lessons like this and, and just teaching people um, about our country, our constitution definitely helps there, but. Thank you. I am at this point going to ask just for some closing comments by people. Yeah, 30 to 60 seconds, you know, a conclusion, a last thing you wanted to say. I just, just for each of you, John first, would you care to, yeah, closing words? <clears throat> uh, well, I, you know, I guess I'm, I'm probably gonna repeat myself, but I, uh, I, I, I believe, let's put it this way, I have faith in the capacity of people to reason things out and to appreciate the, the, um, the magnificent structure of the government they've been given and that they've inherited. If uh, materials are set up in such a way as to, in, you know, di encourage them to, to engage in disciplined discussion. I think they'll find something that Steve mentioned. I uh, I can't remember what the specifics were about the capacity to change your mind, and that um, that that sometimes people can be brought if you set the situation up, they can be brought to experience the something like uh, I uh, you know I thought I understood this issue and I understood my position on it. And now I realize that maybe it's a little more complicated than I thought. And the other side has something uh, that I need to listen to and think through. And uh, I, I actually went through something like this way back in the 80s myself when I was applying for a job in, uh, in a company that produced a, a news program for, for kids. I'll date myself because it showed because the issue then was SDI, the, the Strategic Defense Initiative that Reagan was promoting. And at the time, I was opposed to it. And in the interview, we were asked, all the people in the interview were asked to uh, take the side, take one side and then take the other side. And I remember going back to, to home and, and talking to my wife at the time and saying, you know, uh, I took I I took I presented my point of view and then when I had to present the other point of view I found that I was more convinced by, by my argument than I was by my the view that I had at that time held and uh that started something in in my thinking that you know you people can change and people can um come to appreciate their the complexity of the of 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 issues better than they do if the if the experiences are set up such as, as to induce that. Thank you so much. Um, Steve again, then. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I'll say a couple of things. One, I, I just think it's so important, uh, you know, even given, uh, you know, the one consideration that was raised in the question about whether we're in a post-constitutional state of affairs. I mean, I, I don't think we should be naive about uh, sort of where we're at as a country in terms of our original, uh, you know, constitution or the historical, uh, you know, spirit of our system of government or anything like that. Um, but at, at, at the same time, I, I, I think it remains critical to try and 
um, address these challenges uh, through education. I mean, Alex was uh, talking about that in her talk, how important education is. And, and the thing about education is, I mean, it's a it's a long haul, right? You, you can't just, you, everyone knows you can't cram for an exam. I mean, if you're good, maybe once in a while, but as a general rule, cramming is not a great strategy. And I think similarly with civics education, uh, you know, this isn't something that one course somewhere fixes. Uh, you know, it's something that needs to be layered in. It needs to be reinforced over time. It needs to be built upon. And so, you know, I, I think the the lessons that, that John's designed here, I mean, it, we would be way better off if every student in America was taking these these lessons during Constitution Week, and then that was building on a whole uh, course. And I know you have a set of standards uh, that you've developed and all of that. And, um, you know, some kind of standards that that establish that students are, are learning this kind of thing. And then, of course, reinforcing it uh, for Americans who go to college or university um, and, and that they get these things. And, um, you know, it's, it's about understanding the knowledge, uh, you know, having the history under your belt. Uh, but I, I think it's also about learning the the sort of spirit of our system of, of constitutional government and uh, understanding, um, you know, that the Constitution, our institutions, yes, they evolve historically. That's a that's a natural thing that happens over time to some degree. Obviously, some changes are, are better than others and some things should remain uh, more consistent. Um, but, uh, you know, you set up the rules of the game and then try to play the game within those rules. And I think it's important for um, Americans to understand that, um, you know, the rules really need to be to some degree things that, that we agree upon uh, to hold us together. And of course the constitution, um, the bill of rights, all of that, you know, these are sort of the ultimate rules. And so, you know, just one example that comes to mind is something like the, the filibuster in the Senate, which of course it was developed in a certain way over time, but, that's an example where we see people increasingly wanting to maybe do away with the rules of the game in order to gain something in the short term. And, and this is a bipartisan problem. Uh, the Electoral College is, is another example. Um, you know, that there's there's reasons that these things are set up the way that they are. Um, and that, uh, you know, I think one thing civics education could really contribute over time is, is giving people an understanding of, you know, what the benefits are of the way that things have been designed and organized and, and, and to some degree developed over time. Um, and then, you know, we can certainly fight it out on our policy disputes um, and all of that, uh, you know, within the rules. But uh, increasingly, it seems like Americans don't even know what the basic rules are and uh, our leaders are willing to break the rules in order to gain, um, you know, immediate policy wins, which seems like a, a really, uh, um, disastrous way to approach things, you know, to get a short-term gain, but at what cost in the long-term. Thank you. Alex. Yeah, look, I think we've covered a lot of uh, uh, problems in our institutions and in our systems. When you have a fraction of students leaving eighth grade uh, proficient in history and civics, that's a problem. When you have universities, both private and publicly funded ones, um, uh, punishing kids for for using the wrong pronouns, but not for chanting, uh, you know, death to America, death to Israel, or you know, genocide against the Jewish people. Obviously, you have a problem, and you have uh, people, uh, you know, either not applying our our rules at all or not applying them fairly. I think these um, are all things that point to the need for civics education, like the one laid out here. Um, I really do think that education is right education, teaching kids the right things, forcing them to meet the bars is really the way forward. Um, I think we need to stop spending time in the classroom, teaching kids to be activists, teaching them um, to, you know, go do a protest or go write your senator or representative in support of, uh, you know, gun control or what have you, and just instead presenting them the facts and letting kids come to conclusions by themselves, pushing, you know, real critical thinking instead of certain political, divisive political ideologies um, on them for them to then, you know, go be little activists. So uh, time in a classroom is a zero sum game. And when you focus on the wrong things, kids suffer. And I think uh, the Civics Alliance and NAS are, are giving schools uh, a right things to focus on. So really appreciate their work. Thank you so much. 
Okay, so I'm going to close off with, I encourage you all to look at the lesson plans them yourself uh, and, you know, and s send them to your favorite social studies teacher whom you know and say, hey, take a look at this too. Uh, get the word out. I, we think they're good. We want teachers to have the opportunity to use them. We think it'll be good for education. Um, so yeah, j just every chance... Every chance you can do to sell sell our product, which is available for free, go for it. Um, I will just go over the um, basic stuff, which is your questions. If anything wasn't answered, if something comes up, please send me the um, your questions. You know, Randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L -L at nas.org. I'll be delighted to forward them to the speakers so they can have the opportunity to answer. If you want to watch this again, it should be on our um, YouTube um, uh, channel within 24 hours. If you want yet further fine materials from us, um, coming up soon, we have, for example, a model history of communism standards that should be launching on May 1st. Uh, people should take a look for that. Um, and there is, as John was saying, we are planning on getting work on the rest of the civics uh, model lesson plans for all of grade 12 American birthright. So, you know, we're going to fill it out and ideally, ultimately, all of American birthright from kindergarten to 12th grade. Um, okay, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, the panelists. Thank you, the audience. Uh, in some sense, thank you, particularly the audience. We do this for you. Uh, you're our raison d'etre. But 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 to actually have words being spoken to you, thank you to the panelists. So everybody, it's been wonderful being uh, in this conversation and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.